And that's what angers me because I see so many millions of people crawling on their knees and, uh, and, and worshiping somebody that never even existed. And they worshiping moon gods and sun gods because Allah was a sun god to start with. And then later on, Allah becomes a moon god. And then, and then today, of course, uh, you know, Judaism, uh, has gone through many different, uh, changes. And their religion, they started out as a moon religion when Moses was a moon worshiper. Uh, that's a whole story in itself, and we'll, we'll talk about all that stuff later. But so much of, of the three different major religions today, which I've said tonight two or three times, mm-hmm. the three major religions are actually Hinduism. You can go back to the Hindus and see where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came from. You can see where Jesus and uh, and Joseph and Mary and all of those people in the story of Christianity, the people in the story of the Old Testament, it all goes back to Hindu. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the three major religions today call themselves, uh, we are the offspring of Abraham. They're called Abrahamic religions. Well, yeah, but if Abraham never existed, now what do you do with that? If you find out Abraham never existed and you're telling people that you are a follower of Abraham and you're an Abrahamic religion and then we find out that Abraham never existed, the whole thing is Hindu. Well, now what do you do? Well, you've been out there preaching to the world that you have the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth and you're an Abrahamic, you're a follower of the Abrahamic religion and then we find out there was no Abrahamic religion. It's all Hindu. Now what are you going to do about that? And so now, you know, now the religious community around the world of the major three major religions are falling apart. Well, they should fall apart. Judaism should fall apart. Christianity ought to fall apart. I mean, all three of the major religions are a catastrophe with all the sex and violence and murder and drunkenness and alcoholism and drug addiction and wars and murder and lunacy. Uh, my God. God, all three of those religions are filled with lunacy, stupidity personified. And you know how you and I talked about um, well, how yeah. in Islam, well, talk about some of the stuff we, we found out about Islam. Well, it's it's very interesting that you bring this up because uh, uh, the, the thing that really sort of struck me, I found it unusual, is that I didn't even, and I still don't even come close to having the knowledge you do about religion, but I was very, very interested in the whole sovereignty movement, and I ended up looking up something called the Corporation Soul. Oh, yeah. And so what happened is I looked up a Corporation Soul, and I kept wondering, what's this, and how does it work? And, you know, basically it's sort of like one of the original types of incorporations you could get back in the day. And I think in the Western world, and North America, people use their, their their holy Bibles as form of identification, and the, the father was the the head of the the family company, and you know, corporation soul was interchangeable not only for religious outfits, but also for people at home back in the days in the Wild West. And uh, I looked up corporation soul, and I ended up saying, "Geez, how come there's something in London called the Dai Al Mutlak?" And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's D-A apostrophe I A-L dash M-U-T-L-A-Q. So the Da'i al-Mutlaq. And it's like a branch of uh, Shia Islam. So it's not the whole religion. It's just a branch of it. But I was just thinking, why in the world would these people in 1993 set up a business, a corporation soul, in London, as and not only that, and this is not something I'm, you know, I found on some you know third party website. This is on legislation.gov.uk, and if you go on the internet, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna go to their website and you can type in, and the name is slightly different. It's very close. It's called the Dawat e Hadia Act in 1993, and if you want to look into it and find out that uh, I'm not making this up. You can even download a PDF of the whole thing. And it's on the 1st of July, and it's basically saying this holiness of uh, Sayyidina Muhammad uh, Burhanuddin, 
is the 52nd incumbent of the office. And this is the best part because this is where I got it. This is how I found out about this is this the office. Why in the world do you need to be in an office to practice religion or to practice any kind of spirit, you know, or some sort of faith? Yeah. Uh, and so this is where you would come in. This is more your expertise than me. But when I found out, it's just the concept, the concept that you have to go to, to England of all places and you have to go to the parliament and the parliament has to create a private act. That doesn't mean like the people of, of the United Kingdom get a say in this. They just, it was a private act in 1993. And today, and you were mentioning Hinduism. Um, the Dawoodi Bohras is basically uh, an alternative complement to this, uh, this corporation soul. And so who are the Dawoodi Brahas? Well, basically, uh, if you look it up, they're basically where they're coming from is exactly what you're, where you're talking about. Uh, they're primarily um, in, I'll read, even read it to you here, they're primarily in India. Again, that's, I'm not saying that's, the, that's where you would come in, but I suspect that's where Hinduism sort of started from. Um, and Pakistan, Yemen, and East Africa. I mean, it's, you know, again, it's not the entire religion of Islam, but these guys are, you know, and they're, and it's, it's basically trade. They're, they're talking about business and trade. So why do you need to take a religion uh, or a branch of it and then go to a foreign country, set up a business and start doing business? I don't get it. I don't, I, you know, for, for me, when I grew up, I never, when I went, I used to go to a church when I was a little kid. Uh, I would visit my friends and I have to go to church and I never thought of church as a business ever. But ultimately, it seems to be the case, you know, for this particular branch of Islam. And that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. So I suspect there's probably a lot more out there that people just aren't aware of and they don't know where to look. But when I'm in the company of someone like you, who I have the courtesy and privilege to be around and I get to listen to day in, day out uh, and live with you, well, you know, eventually I start thinking, well, what about this? And I start, start looking in unusual places. And I just stumbled upon this. It was just really incredible. But it just opens up your mind. If, if someone were to sit down and think about the, the ramifications of that, you have to go to England to set up your business. Yeah, and it's a religious business. And like I say, churches are a corporation, and uh, this is why churches are divided into denominations, like fifties and hundreds. That's the way you divide money. There's denominations, and so mm-hmm. the churches are corporations, and they're all money-making uh, corporations. Some of that interesting stuff um, in Islam does have some interesting uh, concepts and, and belief systems. They will kill you. They will cut your head off or stone you to death, you know, heap big stones upon you until you're dead uh, or, or cut your head off or beat you till you're dead if you are a homosexual or if you are, uh, if you're a woman and you commit adultery, you're dead, period. No, there's no, there's no jail time or nothing. They just kill you. And so if you're a homosexual, they kill you. If you are a woman, commit adultery or do anything you're not supposed to do, they just kill you, period. Uh, but uh, if you are, you know, we, we've come to understand how, but if you're a Muslim and you want to rent a little seven-year-old girl for the night uh, for entertainment, uh, that you can do. There's no problem with that. You can rent a child a boy or a girl, six, seven, eight years old, you can rent one for the night. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, we say that you are married, so you have to pay, you have to pay your religious leader in your area, whoever the, 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 uh, the head of your religion is in your area, you have to pay him, uh, a certain amount of money and probably pay the parent a certain amount of money and then you could be married. For overnight, for 24 hours, you can marry a little six-year-old or eight-year-old. And, um, you know, normally we would think of that as lunacy. But, no, it's just normal, and that's par for the course. And and the, and the and Muslim leaders all say there's nothing wrong with that. All of us say that's fine. You can, you can uh, 
rent a little seven-year-old uh, for entertainment for the night. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think, well, well, that's one hell of a god you got there, you know. I mean, <laughs> and that's just one uh, avenue. I mean, it's incredible stuff that that the, that the Islamic religion teaches. And yet, on the other hand, they kill adults who are might you know who are minding their own business. It has nothing to do with the uh, with the religion or government. But they find you as a homosexual, they'll kill you. But if you want to rent a six-year-old, that's different. There's nothing wrong with that. So I just think it's absolutely ludicrous. And and when I hear people say, well, yeah, but that's not all of uh, of Islam. You know, that, there's lots of good people in Islam. I say, wait a minute, no, back up. You're out. You're out of line. If there are so many good people in Islam who are, you know, not like that, they're just good people. Why haven't the good people of Islam spoken up about this mentally deranged, insanity, wacko religion? Why haven't they dropped out and stood up and say, we want nothing to do with this wacko, lunacy religion that rents out little children uh, to grown men, that kills people because of their sexual proclivities? What, you know, I'm just amazed how many good, so-called good Muslims don't say anything. They they see what's going on, but they're not about to open their mouth. Why? Because Islam is a religion of peace and love. And if you speak out against it, they will cut your head off. They don't give a damn about who you, who you are. So because they are loving and kind and loving and wonderful people. And if you don't like what they're doing and they find out, they'll kill you. They'll kill you and your family. So I'm wondering, what kind of a religion is this that murderers, People who have questions about the religion, who don't mind buying and selling children for sexual entertainment. Uh, what is what's going on here? This is lunacy uh, and wholesale. So you and I have talked about all this kind of stuff, and uh, there's so much more that we could talk about in relation to the lunacy of religion and Islam. And Islam's not the only one; it's just one third of the problem. Christianity and Judaism is the same problem. And uh, it's funny you mention that because, you know, I, I was on checking it out and listening to some of your shows where you did discuss this kind of material uh, in different ways. But, you know, there's people out there say, well, that's not possible. There are no such thing as, you know, marriages of children with, with, with young young boys or girls. And, you know, all you have to do is just go on msn.com. <laughs> And on MSN.com, and I'm not talking about six months ago or 35 years ago. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about right now. You go look up. There's an article. It says marriage of a six-year-old girl in exchange for a goat sparks outrage. And so I'm not saying that it's good or bad. I'm just saying there's an article here that's talking about what you're talking about. And it's confirming that this is, seems to be. A way uh, that a way of life that's part of you know how it works. And, yeah, uh, 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 it's a part of the mentality of the Islamic world that women are to cover themselves up uh, all the way up to their eyes. They cover themselves. And I was reading an article about a theologian in uh, in Europe that was making some incredibly interesting comp comparisons. Uh, the women all wear black, and they cover up their face. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so do the so do the nuns, the Catholic nuns. If you go back, especially if you go back many years ago, Catholic nuns did the same identical thing: wore black robes and black uh, dresses, black, and and just their eyes were showing. So, what is that all about? The whole idea of covering up the woman with just her eyes showing. Well, that was the Catholic. Catholic nuns were doing that. Catholic nuns today still wear black robes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and some of them in different countries do wear masks that only show their eyes. So Catholics are doing the same thing with their women that uh, that the Islamics are doing with their women. And uh, there's all kinds of connections between Rome and the way Roman religion works and the way Islam works. And, uh, you know, and th that's a whole story. We could... We could take off and do uh, four or five shows just on the connection between Catholicism, ancient Catholicism, and Islam, and the connections there. 
and how the religion of Islam is connected directly to the old canon religion of of uh, of the Catholic Church, and that oh, Muhammad was uh, you know was involved with Catholics and, and priests and all you know if he was even alive. That's what the you know, that's what the reference works say. But I've I've heard some really interesting lectures by people who are talking about the fact that Muhammad never lived, and I think that's what the real truth is. I don't think there ever was a Muhammad. I think the whole thing is like Judaism and Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's a made-up story. It was all made up during the Middle Ages. Judaism, as uh, I've already said, I think, uh, Judaism was, is not and was not a B.C. religion. There was no such a thing on the earth as ancient Jerusalem and ancient Israel. You know, what we call Jerusalem was a, was already there, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. But it wasn't a great kingdom of Israel. There was no great kingdom of Israel. There was no King Solomon or King David or, or King Saul. Uh, none of those kings ever existed, period. They were merely a story. None of it ever existed, uh, Old Testament or New. But that's not to say that the Old and New Testament are, are not worthy, are not of value. No, they're very valuable because the Old and New Testament in the Bible are metaphors. They're symbolic metaphors, symbolic stories that once you understand symbolism and once you understand what's being said, then it begins all to make sense for the first time. It's symbolism. And it's a metaphor. And then you begin to see what the, where the religions, oh, the value in those religions are. But the way the religion is, is given to us today and all three major religions is ludicrous. Absolutely childish, ludicrous stuff, uh, from Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. It's, uh, there's just no words to explain how absolutely stupid this stuff really is. And, but when we see things like, the, you know, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, that's frightening because that tells me the human race has not only lost their freedom, they've not only lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, they've lost their freedoms, but now we're being told that they're losing their mind. That's the only thing left to lose is your brain, your mind. And so now uh, Islam uh, is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. That tells me the world of mankind has lost its mind. It's not a, it's not a, a, uh, allowed to, it's, you know, we've been arrested. Our intellectual and spiritual advancement has been under arrest. We're not able to grow intellectually and spiritually anymore. We are, we're all in a prison camp. 